Hi, um, I'd like to welcome you all to Burlington today. My name's Kirsten Merriman Shapiro. I work with the Community and Economic Development Office of the City of Burlington. And we are very pleased to have this conference happening in Burlington today. Um, so little is often known by the general public about this fascinating period in our history. And we're very excited to have all the presenters share all their knowledge with us um, about this period in time. And uh, hopefully we all go away from this knowing a little more than we did when we showed up this morning. Probably a lot more for me. Um, so I just want to again thank um, uh, Jess, uh, the new state archaeologist, uh, UVM Consulting, the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, all the presenters for being here. Um, We're, uh, um, like I said, very pleased to have this happening here, and we think it's an important part of Burlington's history and the state of Vermont's history that is um, not as well known as it maybe should be. Um, in some ways. And um, a few matters of housekeeping. If you're looking for a bathroom, this is a historic building. There are no internal steps to the first floor. So take the elevator, go down to the first floor, make a right on the ramp, and you'll find the ladies' and men's rooms just there. And with that, um, Jess, I don't know if you'd like to say a few more words, but I'm very happy to have everybody here today. Thank you so much, Kirsten, and uh, thanks for hosting um, this conference. Um, I uh, would be lying if I said I was any sort of expert on the War of 1812. Um, and uh, I just became the state archaeologist a little over a month ago, um, having taken over from Giovanna Peebles, who was the first and only state archaeologist prior to that time, having served in the post for 38 years. And so I'm meeting some of the uh, presenters and scholars here for the first time as well. And so this is an education for me as well. Some things I know quite well, um, and other things I will definitely be learning for the first time. But I really appreciate all of you being here. As Kirsten said, uh, this is an important but understudied uh, portion of Vermont, Champlain Valley, Burlington history. and. Um, where I'm concerned, the archaeology of this period is also little known but quite rich and very telling um, about, about uh, wartime and also civilian life and, and, um, and off the battle military life. Um, just a couple points of housekeeping for the presenters. Um, in the morning, we are having RETN uh, film this for um, rebroadcast, uh, a broadcast and then rebroadcast at specific points in the future. Um, and so for those presenting, if at some point um, you could sign one of the appearance forms, this is only going to be for the morning. Um, Emily has them and she'll be going around with them um, or bugging you at the break or something like that. Um, and because of that, the podium is at this point for the morning session and we um, don't have a remote, so if you, for the presenters could signal to me when they want a slide change, I will do that. In the afternoon, we might move the podium closer so that we can directly control the laptops, but just, just be aware of that. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to present our first speaker, Gary Shattuck, served for over three decades in the Vermont law enforcement community with the state uh, with the Vermont State Police, the Attorney General's Office, and the Assistant United States Attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice, where he also served as a legal advisor in Kosovo and Iraq. He's a graduate from the University of Colorado and Vermont Law School, and Gary is currently pursuing a master's degree in military history concentrating on the Revolutionary War. He's also a regular contributor to Army History Magazine and the Journal of the American Revolution. His second book, Insurrection, Corruption and murder in early Vermont describes the devastating effects of Thomas Jefferson's embargo of 1807 on those living in northern Vermont and has just been released by the History Press. Uh, and that book forms the basis of this presentation. And it's also available uh, for purchase here today, and I'm sure Gary would be happy to sign a copy um, if you just want to get a hold of him at the, at the break um, or at lunchtime. Uh, we would, uh, he, I think he'd be happy to do that. And so, uh, Without further ado, uh, Gary.
Burlington Bay. If you on the exactly 200 years ago today, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, if you were standing on the grass out here, uh, you would hear a cannon firing off. And from down on the wharf, somewhere down on here, you'd hear a cannon firing in response. And it was a celebration of the arrival of Tom Burlington and uh, gentlemen. Alexander uh, Macon, who were just coming over here for a celebration to take place the following day. So that was just 200 years ago today. Uh, they arrived to cheering. They were uh, coming over on a steamboat. They arrived with an American flag on top of a British flag. And uh, they got off and uh, were wearing uh, evergreen sprigs, uh, which is what the, the Vermont volunteers were wearing during the war. This is to honor them. They took an elegant coach, as I said, uh, followed by a, or preceded by a band, an excellent band of music and officers of the Navy and Army as they came up the hill into Burlington where they stopped at the coffee house, um, had a drink, and then the following day was the big celebration for events that happened on September the 11th, 1814. Before we can get to the celebrations though, we need to back up a little bit, just a few years, uh, because the War of 1812 didn't just all of a sudden spring to life in the year 1812. There was a history to it, why uh, things got bad and uh, arose to that point. We're going to talk about the few years leading up to 1812, which is when this picture was uh, done in 1811. This is compliments of the Lake uh, Champlain Maritime Museum, incidentally. You can do the next one. What we're going to be talking about is, uh, you see the Black Snake Affair up there. This is the explosion that happened in 1808 here in Burlington. This was done just last month to commemorate the passing or the murder of the very first two men in service to the U.S. Treasury Department who were killed on the Onion River uh, enforcing uh, the law in 1808. And these are the Customs Border Patrol uh, Honor Guard that came down as we installed the sign at the uh, uh, Ethan Allen Homestead. Next shot there. And the two men that were killed were two Rutland militiamen, Ellis Drake and Asa Marsh. They had the honor of having their names affixed to the Customs uh, Guide On. So it was a, a great honor. Uh, to have uh, their recognition. Burlington uh, in 1807, 1808 uh, had gone from roughly a population of 300 in 1790, increasing fivefold to around 1700. Uh, it, this period marked roughly a 20 year end of growth and prosperity. From 1808 on, things go downhill uh, for Vermont in general. Uh, the state population at that point had risen from 85,000 to 218. And then roughly in, the, in this next century, that we're, or next decade that we're talking about, 1810 to 20, is when Vermont started to suffer a, a steep decline. Whereas the rest of the nation was growing at 32% uh, population growth, Vermont grew at an 8% population growth. Immigration stopped, um, and immigration outwards uh, picked up. And in that decade, people were leaving Vermont. So what was it that caused all of this uh, reversal of problems, uh, reversal in fortune, if you will, uh, from the 20 years preceding it when Vermont was doing quite well? If you look at the tone of the inaugural dresses of the governors in 1807 and 1808, you can see the predictable things that they were calling on the legislature to deal with things such as schools, highways, and uh, militia issues. But then you start to see something that you don't see in the prior years. You're starting to see the governor calling the legislature to deal with crime that's coming up. Vermont is starting to experience its first wave of, uh, of crime. Uh, governor Israel Smith in 1807 wanted the legislature to pass laws to get people to um, uh, confine to hard labor, but we didn't have any place to put them. This is when the Windsor State Prison was created, 1807. It opened in 1809 right in this period that we're talking about when these men were killed. In 1808, if you look at Governor Isaac Titchener's um, inaugural, inaugural address, a speech, he's looking for the legislature to revise the criminal code to maximize the use of hard labor. And so this is where you see this transition happening from the good to starting to deal with the realities of the crime that's coming into town. What was the problem? There was general lawlessness. It had overwhelmed the constables, it overwhelmed the militia and sheriff's abilities to deal with it. Around the state were a number of jails 
but they couldn't hold anybody. They were porous as could be, escapes happened constantly. It was a cottage industry for local residents to go out and capture them and bring them back to, to get the reward. There was a large amount of counterfeiting taking place right in these years. We had counterfeiters coming in from other states and from Canada, the notorious Stephen Burroughs, king of the counterfeiters, recognized a weak spot, and these men were coming down and working in gangs, uh, undermining the state's ability to get a bank in place, which was happening right at this very, at this very moment. There were forcible rescues of people that were arrested. Gangs of men would attack the police or the constables and, the, and um, jails to pull the people out that had been arrested. These people were receiving upwards of 10-year sentences for counterfeiting. That's how bad it was uh, perceived. There was self-help in extracting debts that were owed. There was kidnapping going on to extract the debt from a person that owed. Extortion. There was maiming taking place if the people were not paying. There were riots on small-scale riots, but these people received small sentences. These people received literally just dollars of a sentence for maiming, whereas the counterfeiters who undermine the social integrity of the financial system were receiving 10-year sentences. The external situation in these few years, this all happened during the um, time of the Napoleonic Wars, 1803 to 1815, which you'll have to keep in mind. Uh, it wasn't just 1812 to 1815, it happened uh, and had a significant impact in these years. There was the English Industrial Revolution that was taking place precisely at these moments, demanding great quantities of raw materials. And in, as in the past and up to the time of the Industrial Revolution, uh, these, a lot of these were coming from North America. Uh, things, uh, timber, potash, uh, wheat, anything that we could produce it was going in to feed this industrial machine. But Vermont had the unfortunate uh, situation to be landlocked, much like Switzerland. It had no way to get its goods to market. It had the Connecticut River, and it wouldn't have until 1823 the uh, canal going down into Albany. But in this time, what they did have was access to the Montreal market, which all went by a water over Lake Champlain. So it was terribly important. Next uh, shot there. And you would see these, this wasn't uncommon in the spring and in the early summer until the waters began to drop, but you would see these rafts out on Lake Champlain, huge rafts. Uh, they were all put together of what they call cribs, 25 by 25 foot section, pulled together with mass, and uh, they put up a little cabin like structure there, and they would float these things down into Montreal. You, it was not uncommon to see these, they were uh, jaw dropping, even for people living then. And they sent down uh, potassium and pearl ash, which was required by the British for lye, gunpowder, soap, glass, paper, textiles, uh, for processing textiles. It was used in a process called fulling to make, make uh, textiles soft. Vermonters would use this ash, which was a refined product that came out of uh, the wood products uh, when the timber was burned. They would use this ash to pay debts to local merchants. Uh, in Vermont at the time, 300 pounds of ash would get them roughly 10 to $25. But it sold for $700 a ton in Liverpool, England. So massive demand for this. They would ship it to um, England via uh, these barrels, potash barrels. Uh, Eric, you probably would recognize these from the Maritime Museum. Next uh, shot there. These are modern day recreations, and it's on the Lois McClure at this very moment, uh, of potash barrels, stand roughly three feet tall, kind of squatty things, uh, and you would hold up to uh, 500 pounds of ash per barrel. But thousands of these were leaving and going into Montreal in order to go to England. They were going by sleigh, they were going by wagon, um, they were going by boats, they were going by rafts. So it was ter tremendously important. The cost of transporting via water uh, was $5 for 100 pounds over 300 miles of land, but it was only 15 cents on the water. So the water was critically important. It was critically important to the Burlington businessmen at the time. As I explained in my book here, 
about this Black Snake affair. That's one of the unspoken things. The Burlington businessmen that were complicit in the murders that took place here, they were terribly possessive about uh, not having their trade interfered with. So the thing that was um, generating a lot of fire was this presence of the Federalists versus the Republican Democrats. The Federalists in favor of strong government, strong military, pro-business, uh, aligned as essentially British apologists. Whereas the Democrats, headed by Jefferson, were for small uh, government, agrarian, domestic uh, manufacturers, and a small military. So you had these, and plus Jefferson was a Francophile. Jefferson's policy was to be reactive, not proactive. He did not, he did not anticipate problems to send the military out. He reacted to the problem. In fact, after uh, getting the uh, Louisiana Purchase, that was one of the pitfalls of the American military system at the time, is he did not beef up uh, the security on the frontier. Here in Burlington, the ratio of Federalists who were strongly inclined to trade and keeping in alignment with Britain, the ratio was four to one for Republicans, Jefferson Republicans, four to one. Terribly important because when you see a re uh, soldiers coming in to enforce a Republican an unpopular Republican law, you had this spontaneous explosive response by the Federalist businessmen in Burlington. If you went to the hotbed of smuggling at this time out in Alberg, uh, the ratio was 15 to one. It was very strongly uh, Federalist in these years. So there was high resentment uh, to Jefferson and his policies. As I mentioned, uh, Napoleonic Wars were going on. American prestige was uh, being affected. Impressments were uh, being done. They were taking men off of American ships to put them on British ships because they didn't have British sailors because they were on the continent fighting uh, Napoleon. In June 1807 we, al 1807, we almost went to war in the matter of the Chesapeake and the Leopard. That was the famous incident where the Leopard, HMS Leopard, attempted to take American seamen off of Chesapeake and ended up shooting into the, the ship and killing three uh, three Americans. It didn't go to war, but Jefferson knew he had to do something to with uphold American prestige. And in December 1807, pretty much single-handedly, he came up with this thing called an embargo. Jefferson called it a candid and liberal experiment. It was a form of peaceful coercion. Those of you that are into history you know Gordon Wood. Gordon Wood says it was a very strange act. It was an act of self-immolation. What Jefferson was trying to do was to do something economically he couldn't do militarily. And economically, what he could do was deprive the Europeans of the American raw products in order to stop their war and stop the depredations on American shipping. So this embargo was put into place in December 1807 and stopped all trade from the uh, Atlantic coast going to Europe. The, Ameri uh, the Vermonters made a lot of fun of it. It didn't affect them. They called it, uh, they made fun of the oh, grab me law. Oh, grab me is embargo spelled backwards. So they were making fun of that, but then payback can be a bear. In March 1808, uh, Washington recognized uh, that they hadn't covered all of the loopholes and they imposed the land embargo. So from Passamaquoddy Bay in Maine over to Lake Ontario, all of a sudden the entire border was shut down. No longer were any goods allowed to go to Canada which naturally caused a lot of problems right here in Burlington, these Federalists who hated this Republican uh, Jefferson. At that time, the federal presence here in Burlington in 1808 uh, was consist mainly of a couple customs officers, a uh, federal judge, and a U.S. Marshal. Customs was very, very important at this time. Without the Customs Service, um, we couldn't have uh, funded the purchase of Louisiana, Oregon, Florida, and the Alaska purchases. Uh, these uh, monies built Washington, D.C. They built all the lighthouses, the military and naval academies. By 1835, the national debt was reduced to zero because of the customs uh, uh, duties that were coming in. No taxes, general taxes, happened in the U.S. until the early 20th century, thanks to customs. And that's why we talk about these customs officers and how they were doing their duties in these particular years with the embargo. And that's why it's so critically important uh, to understand that role. The customs collector 
the next shot there. What is it? Oh, these incidentally, these were, this is from uh, Special Collections of Daily Home. This is fascinating. These are uh, smugglers' notations that are on the side of barrels. Oh. Uh, yeah, smugglers' notations. You can't make them out, they're like hieroglyphics. Uh, that were recorded by customs officers uh, in these particular years as they seized the um, uh, goods that were uh, potash that was going north. Uh, the next shot. This is uh, Jabez Peniman. He was the customs collector. He was the husband of Francis Allen, Ethan Allen's uh, wife. After Ethan had died, Jabez uh, met her. The two of them married, and he lived up here. He owned land along the Onion River. So it was him, appointed by Jefferson, uh, who was in charge of these customs collections. As we get into the war, others are going to talk about it, we go from these very few men in 1808 to the time of the war, 1812, 13, 14. The federal presence of civilian enforcers explodes to over 600 arrive in, in Vermont. And they are out collecting revenue from everything they possibly can to fund the bankrupt U.S. government that's trying to prosecute this war. There were a lot of problems with the War of 1812. We didn't have a plan, we didn't have money, and others will talk about all the other issues, but uh, it, was a, it was a game of catch-up. But the point being that we had this sudden explosion of federal employees here in Vermont and who took their job very seriously, and we had aggressive em enforcement it was greatly resented by Vermonters. On the state side, we have uh, Chittenden County Sheriff Daniel Staniford, who had the statutory right to call out the militia uh, in case of a problem. And we had uh, the excellent uh, state's attorney, William Harrington, were to deal with um, prosecutions. Next shot there. Another man that comes to light, an incredible man, actually, Cornelius Van Ness, friend of Aaron Burr, Right after Burr killed Hamilton, Van Ness decided he didn't have any uh, ability to make a profession in New York, and he shows up in Vermont. And he ends up assisting the uh, federal employee or the state employees in their prosecution of the murders. He goes on to become a state legislator in the Vermont Supreme Court. He becomes a Vermont governor. He becomes a minister to Spain, and he falls out of grace during the Andrew Jackson administration. Incredible man. Um, and it's all in the book. Anyway, in April 1808, with this uh, embargo now in place, the smuggling is taking place, and in a convoluted way, and I explained how it comes to be, Jefferson declares the entire area around Lake Champlain to be in a state of insurrection. And he call it, says it's an insurrection uh, based upon representations made to him by Van Ness and Penniman. Uh, the Burlington residents are in disbelief that this, they've been disparaged in this way. They've been called insurrectionists. Uh, they've had their trade cut off. And at the same time, Penniman and the other customs people are going to be adamant to enforce the laws. With the declaration of insurrection, it allows the state governor to call out the militia. And he does do that. And he calls out the St. Albans militia who, as it turns out, is ineffectual. You don't call the militia out of the same community where the smugglers are coming from because the militia is going to have a, not much inclination to enforce the law. That goes nowhere. They summon up um, three companies out of Rutland, two infantry and one cavalry. The infantry set up in Swanton Falls and another one at uh, Windmill Point, and then the cavalry just kind of floats as needed. And also, uh, go to the next shot here. Uh, this just happens to be representative of the cannon of the War of 1812, but also one of the very first horse-drawn artillery units came out of the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts to Windmill Point. They came up right at this time, 16 men, uh, carrying two brass six-pounders, um, a bunch of 125 muskets, uh, a bunch of ball, ammunition, and what have you, to supplement the militia. And they go out onto Windmill Point. That summer of 1808, near as I can identify, there were three smuggling operations going on. There were the Hoaxies, uh, Father Frederick and his two sons, uh, John and Jacob out of Alberg, and uh, the Taylors, the brothers John and Ezekiel from Lower Canada. But there was a third one that was running this boat called the Black Snake. 
And this is where all the trouble arises. The black snake, according to the court documents, I spent a lot of time in court documents and was able to establish the black snake, was involved in other incidents beyond the one we're going to talk about. So the black snake floated uh, with these other smuggling groups. They shared men. Um, they were very much on top of what it is the militia could and couldn't do, and they anticipated uh, what kind of uh, opposition they were going to meet. The black snake itself was about 40 feet long, 14 feet wide, four and a half feet, four, four and a half feet tall, excuse me. Um, problem, no problem. Four and a half feet at the sides, a single mast, a removable rudder, capable of being moved by seven uh, oarsmen on a side. It was used as a, as a ferry between Charlotte and Essex. And it was all smeared on the outside with black tar, and that's why I got the name the Black Snake. And it could hold upwards of 100 of those barrels that I showed you earlier. So it was a very uh, important boat. And there's, there's just a lot of material with regard to it, and it's, it, again, it's all in the book. The plan by this group that was uh, driving or steering the Black Snake that summer, headed by a man by the name of Truman Mudgett and eight others, included a Cyrus Dean. If you recognize Dean, it's the, well, we'll get to Dean, young man about 18, 20 years old. The plan was to come up the Onion River to uh, the falls and go to Guy Catlin's and Joseph Jasper's business and pick up the potash that they had collected in their business from all of the farmers that had been coming in to uh, collect their goods. And unfortunately for Truman and his boys, coming down uh, out of uh, Missisquoi Bay, they had little men and they had little ammunition. So they were in search of workable guns. And what they did was uh, on August the 1st, they got as far as the blacks, or the, uh, the sandbar. And they went to uh, one of the men, uh, Samuel Mott's brother's home, and they picked up a gun that looked a lot like this. So if you, uh, well, go, go one more. There we go. It's called a punt gun. This one was nine feet four inches long. The barrel was eight feet four inches. It was an inch and a half uh, bore opening. You put it, you loaded it by taking a hand, two handfuls of powder and you poured it down in it. And then you stuffed in 15 separate one ounce balls. It was devastating. It was used out on the waterways to uh, take down large amounts of uh, geese and ducks or what have you. You would sneak up on them in a, what they called a punt boat and then you were just in the weeds. When the ducks would land, you just let them have it and you would just kill hundreds of them. It was used down um, on the Chesapeake also. There are other reports that this was a common French arm that was used uh, by the French army. And that could be, they did use these wall pieces or wall guns is what they're alternatively called for uh, filling in battlements. On uh, July 31, the, uh, why don't we just back up one, here we are to this map. And I don't have time here to go through the whole thing, but Windmill Point is right here. This is where one of the Rutland contingencies was located. And uh, the, plan, uh, the information that Jabez Peniman got, the customs collector, was that the Black Snake was coming out of Missisquoi Bay, headed down the, the uh, east side of the Hero Islands, and coming down around Colchester Point and up to uh, the Onion River. Peniman went out to, um, to Windmill Point and he ordered the men there because the militia uh, were beholden to him. He was the, as the head customs guy, he could tell the militia what to do. And he ordered the men to get in the fly, which is what the, cut, the revenue cutter was called, and to go in pursuit of the, uh, the black snake. We can go ahead to another one, next shot there. There you go. This is, uh, I of all the thousands of pictures I took, perhaps the most moving document from the Vermont Historical Society uh, was the payroll of July 31st of um, Benjamin Pratt's men on Windmill Point. And if you look very closely, you won't be able to see it, but number, uh, the lieutenant was a Daniel Farrington. He's the man that was in charge of the fly. And if you go down further here, you see the names of the two men, Ellis Drake and Asa Marsh, the two men that we showed you the streamers on earlier that were murdered. You can see their pay, and it's dated July 31. In 72 hours, two of them are gonna be dead. 
So this is, uh, this is a pretty incredible document to my mind. Uh, on August the, uh, yeah, why don't we go to, um, go back, there you go. The fly leaves the, um, leaves Windmill Point, comes around Alberg Tongue, goes up in the Siskoi Bay and starts making inquiries, have you seen the black snake? And people tell him, yeah, it's headed down the Onion River. So the fly comes down, comes down, comes down. At the end of August the 2nd, it's sitting out here on the point, waiting for the black snake to come out of the Onion River. On that day, the, the black snake crew had thought they were going to run in, get their 100 barrels, turn around and leave. But then they found out the militia was on top of them, and they ended up spending the night of August the 2nd in a home that they invaded and took over and cleaning their guns. At which point two certain gentlemen, we don't know their names, but I kind of identify them in the book, two certain gentlemen, because the court would not allow testimony to disparage these Burlington policemen, uh, businessmen, came to, them, came to the smugglers, said, we're not going to give you any barrels of potash because the fly, the militia is out there and they're going to take it and it uh, doesn't make any sense. Um, the, the smugglers show them this big gun that they have. Uh, they tell them they need more ammunition uh, and what have you, and the businessmen say, yeah, we can help you. They bring him into Burlington. It wasn't a very terribly long walk. They brought him into Burlington, gave him ammunition, and they said, we'll give you uh, 10 gallons of rum if you'll kill every single one of them. And apparently uh, some of them agreed because as we go on in the next day, there is disagreements that break out amongst the smugglers on the black snake. Some agree we need to kill these militiamen, and other men saying, no, it's just too drastic a thing for us to do. Uh, but anyway, they spent that night uh, cre uh, making um, ammunition. And then this is the day when everything happened, August the 3rd, 1808, when the smugglers are up there on the river uh, getting ready to, uh, to leave. And also on the river uh, were um, a number of farmers that were living out along the Ethan Allen homestead. All this took place just north of the Ethan Allen homestead. We can go to that other map shot. Yeah. Uh, they had come up, the smugglers had come up, and they had stopped roughly in this vicinity here. The, the, um, the fly began to start and coming up, and we see the disagreements breaking out amongst the smugglers in this area. And they end up moving an ambush site from down here to up in this area where the black snake had been located behind an island. The, Middle militiamen negotiate their all the way, way all the way up the river, and they get into this vicinity and they see the black snake moored along, the, tied to some bushes on the south side of the Onion River, and they take it without incident. Uh, but they catch a lot of lip from the uh, from the smugglers who are there. They, the, the militia have no reason to arrest the smugglers; they're just out to get the black snake to take their means away from them. So they took the black snake in this vicinity, and they start to go down. And I tell the story of what happened as the two boats, as the fly and the black snake are descending the river when a shot rings out and Ellis Drake is struck in and upon the left temple, a little above the left eye, penetrates four inches and it kills him uh, instantly. That's the first man to kill uh, in service to the U.S. Treasury Department. Jonathan Ormsby, a local farmer uh, who also was an experienced militiaman, uh, gets upset that as to how things are going on, he admonishes Farrington, you need to get up here and take the smugglers. I don't have time to go into how, how the whole thing happened, but the uh, militiamen come onto the shore, they line up and get ready to take these smugglers who are shooting at them from the bushes when Samuel Mott lets this big gun go. And when he fires that thing, it just has a devastating impact. It hits Jonathan Ormsby, one of the local farmers, and uh, killed him instantly. He, he had time enough to say, Lord have mercy, I'm a dead man. Azamar, standing next to him, uh, just had time to gasp for breath once or twice, could not speak, and instantly died. We had three men dead now, two, two militiamen and a local farmer. Daniel Farrington, uh, the lieutenant, uh, caught one right in the head and took away a piece of his skull, but he lived and he also caught uh, some buckshot in the arm. 
Uh, help comes from Burlington, because it's not too terribly far away. Arrests are made. Uh, and then on the following day, August the 4th, they hold the funeral for these men at the Burlington Courthouse. Uh, that summer, they had not taken any um, aggressive action against the smugglers, and I, and I expect that it was because they didn't want to anger uh, the smugglers and make things worse. But anyway, with the murders, they went out and they arrested the hoaxes and the tailors. Uh, boats were seized. There was great outrage in Burlington. Next shot there. This is the famous... Uh, Three coffins, you've seen this. This has came out uh, right at that time, and it just is shouting to the people, can you believe what's happened in the Burlington community? Um, go ahead to the next shot. And this is the indictment from the uh, state archives that was handed down by the grand jury charging three of the men uh, with murder. One of them, the Cyrus Dean, uh, is one of the three men that were tried. They had three trials, bang, 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 like within, within two weeks. They had the most important trials take place here at the Burlington Courthouse. Uh, two of them ended up getting overturned. Dean ended up getting convicted um, and sentenced to death and took an appeal to the Vermont legislature. At the same time, the federal system begins to kick in. They bring uh, treason charges against uh, the hoaxes and the tailors. This requires the presence of the U.S. Supreme Court justice. Yeah. And um, Brock Holst Livingston comes to Vermont, and uh, they have the trial, and I explain all that happened there. On November the 11th, Cyrus Dean is executed at the Elmwood Cemetery. He's hung and then lowered down and then put into a grave. This is the first uh, execution in Vermont history or Vermont state history, because there were executions prior to that. In January 1809, three of the men are convicted of manslaughter. And go on to the next one. Uh, this is a pillory right here at the uh, Courthouse Square. It's an 1817 diagram of the uh, Courthouse Square with a large 80-foot pine where men were whipped. Um, then next shot. The prison had been done by this point, and they ended up going in as prisoners 7, 8, and 9. More smuggling exploded in January 1809. They just come out of the woods like crazy. Slaves are heading to Canada. More gangs, more rescues, more assaults. Then we see the approach of the war coming here in uh, June of 1812. The smuggling continues. Vermonters are sending beef, pork, tobacco, alcohol straight into the hands of the British Army. It was so important that they were providing the British Army that it affected the strategy of the Brits uh, not to invade via Vermont. There was at that time also an outward exodus of northern residents who were taking place at that time. Murders were committed uh, against uh, customs officers. It just was general uh, mayhem up, till, up, th up to and through the war. And I explain a number of things that take place once the troops get here in Burlington. 2,000 troops arrive here. Troops complicit in smuggling. Uh, there's questions about the use of military law against civilians, extra legal tribunals, suspension of civil rights. Um, and essentially all of this mindset, this opposition that you see happening at the time of the war started at the time of 1807 with the embargo and then Vermont's response to that with the killing of, uh, with the opposition to the uh, militia officers coming in and then their murders. 